Hi, my name is Philip Mount Stephen, and it's my great privilege to be Bishop of Truro and a great joy to be talking to you today about a subject that's really close to my heart and I, I hope will be close to yours too by the time that I've uh, finished this talk. I had an unusual start to my Christmas in 2018 when I was run up, rung up by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, not as I hoped to wish me a happy Christmas. Instead, he asked me if I'd be willing to lead a review of the way that the UK Foreign Office had addressed, or maybe hadn't addressed, the persecution of Christians worldwide. Now, it became clear that this was a request from the then Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, who was very moved by this issue and clearly concerned both about the human stories of those who were caught up in persecution and worried too that his department just wasn't doing enough about it. Now, to be honest, it was terrible timing for me because I hadn't even started in Truro, but it's a really important issue too, so I said yes. Now, I want to say straight away that even though this was really bad timing for me, it also became clear to me that God was in this in a big way. And I absolutely want to give our God the praise and the glory for the very significant things that have happened as a result of the work of that review. But what makes me say that God was at the heart of it all? Well, first, the request from Jeremy Hunt came straight out of a meeting he'd attended with the Archbishop that had been organised by the charity Open Doors, which is one of the leading charities working for the persecuted church worldwide. And it turns out that Jeremy Hunt was willing to go to that meeting, both because he's a Christian himself and because years before he'd written the book God Smuggler, written by Open Doors founder, brother Andrew, and he'd been profoundly impressed with it. So this wasn't accidental. This was an issue close to his heart. And second, it, it was as if just a small window opened up to get this work done. Jeremy Hunt wasn't Foreign Secretary for all that long, but he made this a priority in his time, and we raced against the clock to get it finished, and the clock was ticking because the Tory leadership campaign was coming to an end. Jeremy Hunt was up against Boris Johnson, and we know what happened. Jeremy Hunt moved on from being Foreign Secretary, but he did that not before both he and the government had accepted the reviews really far-reaching recommendations in full. So by the grace of God, we squeeze this really significant piece of work through that small window, just in time before it's shut. And let me tell you how the team came together. I used to minister in Paris, in the Anglican Diocese in Europe, and someone else in the diocese at the same time, up in Brussels, was a man called David Fieldsend. And just about the time I moved to Truro, he retired from Brussels and moved back to Cornwall. And he'd already said to me that if there was anything he could help with once I was in post, he'd be happy to. And what was he doing in Brussels? Well, he was working on just this kind of issue and had loads of contacts. So he was a real gift of God to me. And it goes on. He recommended someone called Rachel Varney, who was down in Cornwall and had a really strong background working in Parliament and in public policy. She'd been doing some maternity cover for the council, which had come to an end. So she was doing some supply teaching. So surprise, surprise, she too was free and available just when I needed someone. And you can add to that someone called Charles Hoare, who both David and Rachel knew anyway and had worked with before. He's based in London and he was recommended to me because he's worked on just this kind of issue at the United Nations and in the UK. And lo and behold, he too was available so he could run the London end of things. Now, now I ask you, what are the chances of three people all Christians who already knew about this subject, two of them based in Cornwall, what are the chances that those people would have been free, willing and available all at the same time? Well, I'd say they'd be pretty slim, which is why I say that God was in this in a big way. So I was pretty much handed my team on a plate and without that team, it would have been just impossible. And I could go on. The recommendations of the review, I said this just now, they were just for the Foreign Office. 
but to my surprise and my delight, they were adopted by the government as a whole, as one of the last things that happened before Theresa May resigned. Even then, I thought that that might be it. But no, a commitment to re implement all the recommendations of my review uh, featured in the Tory manifesto in late 2019, and that commitment was reiterated in the recent Global Britain paper that the government produced. And people in Parliament, in both the Commons and the Lords, go on referencing the Truro Review as a kind of touchstone. So I think you can now say that this issue is on the agenda in a way that it just wasn't before, and in a way that I think makes it very difficult to drop. And I'm surprised, and I'm delighted by all that, but I'm also really thankful. And I want above all else to say, to God be the glory. This was his work from start to finish. And everything we as a team were able to do was thanks to the strong following wind of the Holy Spirit that truly filled our sails. And I was hugely aware of the many, many people who were praying for our work. And I do believe that made a really significant difference. And if you were one of those people, well, thank you so very much. And do know what a difference your prayers made. Now, you might ask why I was asked to do this. Well, sometimes I wonder too. But the fact is that before coming to my present job, I used to lead an international mission agency, Church Mission Society. So my knowledge of the global church was pretty good. One of the last trips I made for that job was to Nepal. Now, for a few years, Nepal was wide open to the ministry of the gospel. And the growth of the church there has been just astonishing. One of my friends there used to conduct ministry in prisons and baptise many people in that context, all with the blessing of the authorities. But all that now has changed completely. I visited his office where there's a map on the wall of Nepal and of all the churches that they have planted across the country. And it's hugely impressive. But that map is above a desk and it's just hung. It's not stuck on the wall. So if they were raided by the authorities, they could simply lift the map off the wall, turn it round and pop it down behind the desk out of sight. I went with him to visit a project that he and his team were supporting down by the river in Kathmandu. And we met and we prayed with the young pastor who led the project down there. We prayed with him specifically because earlier that day he'd been visited by the police who asked him, what are you doing here? and ordered him to report to the police station the next day to give an account of himself and of his activities. Well, the answer to the question, what are you doing here, was simple. He and the people working with him were providing the community with clean water. They were supplying the children with kit for schools, and they had set up a watertight, well-lit building where children could study and do their homework in the dry. And yes, they were proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And for doing all of that, the pastor had to report to the police and explain himself. My friend who organised the project and the church planting said to me, we had a small window of liberty for a few years and we took full advantage of that. Now we've just gone back to how it was before, but it won't stop us doing what we're doing, but it will make it more risky. Now, that's just one small example of the pressure and persecution the church can face worldwide. And of course, the pressure and persecution the church can face can be much more extreme than that. But it was certainly an experience that made a deep impression on me and which I think set me up well for the work of the review. Incidentally, I asked my friend recently what happened to that pastor and he replied, the church you visited is still there. The pastor was questioned by the police authorities. Now the police authority have allowed the church to meet, but yes, they create problems, accusing him of converting people. And these kind of anti-conversion laws are an increasing problem worldwide, leading to increased persecution and pressure for Christians in many places. Anyway, my friend goes on to say, we're still there serving to support 50 kids who come every day for education and food. We also support financially to pay for education support for 20 disadvantaged children. And then he says, 
please continue to pray for that ministry, which is very important. And it is very important. So please do be people who pray for the persecuted church and its ongoing ministry and lift our brothers and sisters worldwide to the Lord in prayer. Prayer for them really does make a difference. So all of that is by way of introduction to how we set up the review with just a, a punishing six month window to squeeze it in. Now, that's not much time to do a huge piece of work like this. In the UK in recent years, as you may be aware, we've had some huge judge-led public inquiries. You might know of names like the Savile Inquiry or, or Leveson or, or Chilcot. Now, these were huge efforts that took years and cost a small fortune. And what we did was definitely not like that. If they were a, a full MRI and CAT scan, we just had a, a, a thumb and a thermometer. We've taken the temperature and we've felt the pulse. But actually, as doctors know, you can tell a lot about a patient just by doing that. And so while I wouldn't go to the stake over every jot and tittle of our review and its recommendations, I'm pretty confident both in what we found, in what we concluded, and in what we recommended. I think, by and large, by the grace of God, we got it right. But why was this needed in the first place? Well, it's now over seven years since the Times newspaper published an editorial which it entitled Spectators at the Carnage. And it began like this. Across the globe, in the Middle East, Asia and Africa, Christians are being bullied, arrested, jailed, expelled and executed. Christianity is by most calculations the most persecuted religion of modern times. Yet Western politicians until now have been reluctant to speak out in support of Christians in peril. Well, happily, Jeremy Hunt was willing to speak out, and so we set the review up. Now, in some ways, it seems like the persecution of Christians has kind of come out of a bit of a clear blue sky. It was a real issue back in the old days of the Cold War, where Christians and churches in some contexts in the Soviet bloc behind the old Iron Curtain experienced really significant pressure. Post-1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall, however, it kind of seemed to recede, only to creep up on us by degrees over the last few years. Until now, it is a really, really serious global problem. And there are two things, I think, that are striking about its re-emergence. First, where once it seemed only to be located behind the Iron Curtain, it's now, sadly, a truly global phenomenon, present in pretty much every continent. But it is not a single global phenomenon. It has multiple triggers and drivers. The second factor is that because the re-emergence of Christian persecution has been gradual and has lacked a single driver, it has to some extent been overlooked in the West. It has crept up on us unawares. And the Western response, or the Western lack of response, has been certainly coloured by a lot of ignorance about matters of faith, as well as some embarrassment about it. Before the review, you certainly got the impression that some politicians would rather look anywhere other than at this issue. Now, that is a real problem, and it's really a Western problem as well. People who adopt that position, who see faith and religious belief as, as irrelevant or, or marginal to life, they just fail to grasp how, for the vast majority of the world's inhabitants, faith and religious belief is crucial to how they see themselves and to how they behave. For most of the world's population, faith and belief are not just a leisure pursuit as we tend to see it in this country. Maybe even Christians can see it some, uh, a little like that. Faith and religious belief are fundamental to how people see themselves, both individually and as communities. At the launch of the review in January 2019, I outlined six reasons why I felt that the review, focusing specifically on the plight of Christians, was needed. And they're worth repeating now. First, we have to appreciate that today the Christian faith is primarily a phenomenon of the global south. That's to say of Africa, Asia and South America. 
And because the Christian faith is primarily a phenomenon of the global south, it is therefore primarily a phenomenon of the global poor. It's not an expression of what you might call white Western privilege, although a lot of West, white Western people and politicians still think that it is. But unless we understand that today the Christian faith is primarily a phenomenon of the global poor, we will never give this issue the attention it and they deserve. Second, this particular focus on Christian persecution is justified because Christian persecution, like no other form of persecution, I would argue, is a global phenomenon. It happens pretty much everywhere across the world. And that's simply because the Christian faith today is truly a global phenomenon. Christian persecution is not limited to one context or challenge. It's a single global phenomenon, but with multiple drivers. And that, to my mind, is why it deserves special attention. We really need to understand just what is going on. And more importantly, and I think it's really important to say this, Christian persecution is certainly not limited to Islamic contexts. This is not just about Islam, though some Christians seem to think it is. But if you think it's just about Islam, then you will be turning a blind eye to many other causes of persecution. And let's remember, too, that in many places around the world, Christian-Muslim relations are good and healthy. Thirdly, I argued that Christian persecution is a human rights issue, and we need to see it as such. Freedom of religion or belief is, I would argue, the most fundamental human right because so many other rights depend upon it. If you're not free to think and believe as you wish, then all sorts of other things about how you behave and live your life are closed off to you as well. Again, in the West, we don't tend to think like that. Religious faith is seen as a leisure activity. You can pick up or set down as you wish. We just don't realise how for many people across the world it is so much more than that. I hope it is for us too, if you're a Christian uh, watching this. Uh, religious faith, religious belief is basic to how people see themselves. It's fundamental to how they live their lives. Take away their religious freedom and you take away so many other fundamental freedoms as well. Fourthly, I argued that this is not about asking for special favours for Christians and getting them a better deal than others might have, not at all. But it is, I think, about making up a significant deficit. We in the West have been blind to this issue, particularly, I think, in this country. Partly, I think, that's because of what is called post-colonial guilt, a sense that in the days of the British Empire, we interfered uninvited in various places. So, really, we shouldn't do so again. But this is not about special pleading for Christians. Rather, it's about ensuring that Christians in the Global South simply get a fair deal and a fair share of the UK's attention and concern. So it's an equality issue, if you like. If one minority is on the receiving end of 80% of discrimination and persecution, and that's what the sober international body, the International Society of Human Rights, estimate that Christians face, 80% of discrimination and persecution on the grounds of religion and belief is targeted at Christians. If that's the reality of it, it's simply not fair that our Christians and brother, brothers and sisters across the world should receive so little attention. Fifthly, however, this is also about being sensitive to discrimination and persecution of all minorities and all faiths. I don't want anyone to be persecuted for their faith. Because the Christian faith is perhaps the one truly global faith, it's become what's known as a bellwether for repression more generally. In other words, if Christians are being discriminated against in one context or another, you can bet your bottom dollar that other minorities are as well. So renewing a focus on Christian persecution is actually a way of expressing our concern for all minorities who find themselves under pressure. And if we ignore Christian persecution, it might well mean that we are ignoring other forms of repression and persecution as well. And finally, to look at this from a specifically Christian perspective, the Christian faith has always been subversive. The very earliest Christian creed is made up of just three words, Jesus is Lord. 
Jesus is Lord. As Christians, we can say those words very easily, forgetting what a punch they pack. In fact, they explain why from the earliest days the Christian faith attracted persecution. Because to say that Jesus is Lord was to say that Caesar, the Roman emperor, was not Lord. That is what he claimed, that he was Lord. So to say Jesus is Lord was to make Jesus your ultimate authority and was to court trouble. And that's why as the church grew in the Roman Empire, Christians were increasingly persecuted. Caesar couldn't stand the competition. And one of the reasons you find Christians and other faith groups persecuted today is that there are plenty of world leaders today who lead authoritarian, repressive regimes and will not stand for any sign of dissent. That's why Chinese leaders don't like seeing the sign of the cross and insist the president's picture is put up in churches. They know instinctively what claim Christians make for Jesus. The Christian faith will always present a radical challenge to any power that makes absolute claims for itself. And there are plenty of those in the world today. And that's why I think it's really important that democratic governments in the West stand up to such regimes and stand up for those people, Christians included, who are repressed and persecuted by them. Now, as I said, I was asked to look at how the Foreign Office had responded to the persecution of Christians. Nonetheless, the focus of the review's recommendations is on guaranteeing freedom of religion or belief for everyone, not just for some, but for all. I'll say more about that uh, later. But I do believe that to argue for special pleading for one group over another would be deeply unchristian. But it would also, ironically, expose that group to greater risk by isolating them and unintentionally portraying them as stooges of the West. We must, I believe, seek freedom of religion or belief for all without fear or favour. And there are really good reasons for doing that. So yes, I am concerned with rights for all. So I also want to acknowledge the really significant persecution that other communities have suffered. The Rohingya community in Myanmar have suffered terribly, as have the Yazidis in Iraq. The Ahmadi Muslim community have been persecuted since their very beginning. It's right to recognise the suffering of Christians in India and China, but it will be very wrong to ignore the persecution of Muslim communities in those countries, including the Uyghur Muslims who have suffered appallingly. In many places in the world, it's certainly not safe to admit that you are an atheist, and it should be safe to do that. Jehovah's Witnesses have experienced severe persecution historically and are certainly not free of it today. And of course, Christians historically have not just been persecuted, Shamefully, we have been the persecutors of others. I think with shame of the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, of the pogroms in Eastern Europe. But this isn't just an historical phenomenon. Responsibility for that dreadful massacre of 8,373 Bosniaks in Srebrenica in July 1995 must be laid squarely at the feet of those who called themselves Christians. So to sum up, I wanted to be able to make sure that the work of the review that we did would be acceptable to a mainly secular audience so that it would actually make a difference. But I also wanted to make sure that what we were doing was all of a piece with my own Christian faith. Indeed, that it was the values of the Christian faith that would drive the whole thing forward. So yes, I wanted it to be deeply Christian, and to make a difference in a secular environment. And I think, by the grace of God, we just about manage that. So, how did we go about it all? It's important to be clear what this review was not. To repeat, it was not a major public inquiry or anything like that. We had our thumb and our thermometer. We took the temperature, we felt the pulse. But just as I wouldn't want to oversell what we did, I wouldn't want to undersell it either. We did a lot of research. 
The team travelled globally, took a significant number of witness statements from survivors of persecution included, and that was quite a harrowing experience. We uncovered things that hadn't been revealed before, and much of that evidence is freely available on the website Christian Persecution Review. Dot org dot uk. Christian Persecution Review, all one word, dot org dot uk. So what do we do? First of all, we established a working uh, definition of persecution, which actually hadn't really existed before or doesn't exist in, in the common understanding of this. So what we said was really there needs to be a sliding scale from, from the kind of thing that I experienced in Nepal with that young pastor by the river, where the threat was real, if unspoken, all the way through to mass atrocities and genocide on, uh, at, at, at the other end. And persecution, therefore, is a, is a broad spectrum. It's a, it's a broad phenomenon, but we need to understand it, I think, in those broad terms, because the, the minor things can very easily lead to the major. Having established that working definition, I put together a team made up of those independent members that I mentioned, along with people from key uh, charities and NGOs like Aid to the Church in Need, Open Doors, uh, Christian Solidarity Worldwide. And in all of that, we were supported by staff from the Foreign Office. And then we drew up a map. We drew up a map of the global situation, and that was published at Easter 2019 as the interim report. And alongside that, as I mentioned just now, the team took extensive evidence from people in private witness sessions in this country and in many countries overseas. We conducted a, a survey of those who might have been expected to interact with the Foreign Office overseas. And we conducted a survey of every UK embassy and high commission there is, and there are many, and we talked to various diplomats around the world. So we, we gleaned a whole load of information from a number of uh, different sources. We selected a few focus countries to, to drill down into the situation in those places and, and to look at how the Foreign Office had responded to situations of persecution in those places, or in, if indeed uh, it had at all. And we also compared that response with the response of, of other countries and international bodies that were engaged uh, in those places. So we did quite a lot of work, to be honest. Uh, what is it that we found? Well, at one point in the review, I say that there are two basic threats to human flourishing and harmonious communities in the world today. One is climate change, and the other is the systematic denial of freedom of religion or belief in different places and in many different ways. Now, that wasn't a conviction I had when the review's work began, but it grew on me as the work progressed. Indeed, I was shocked by the scale, the scope, and the severity of this phenomenon that we found. Now, I think we've begun to realise the importance of addressing the first of that pairing, climate change. But it's high time now we recognise the importance of addressing the second. But how do I justify that statement? Well, if you've never read George Orwell's book, 1984, I suggest you do. No other book throws such a spotlight on repression than that book does. And the most chilling aspect, I think, in it is the existence of the thought police and the concept of thought crime. In other words, you could be arrested simply for thinking the wrong thing. Why do I think that's the most chilling aspect of the book? It's chilling because to be denied the liberty to believe what you want to believe, to think what you want to think, and I include in that, that the right not to believe, that is the most fundamental denial of your human rights. It's the most fundamentally constraining and restricting thing that can happen to you. And therefore I believe that freedom of religion or belief is not simply one right amongst many, it's the one on which so many others depend. Because if you're not free to think or believe how you want, how can you order and organise your life in any other way that you choose? It's absolutely fundamental to us. And yet we found that in so many places around the world, we see this right questioned, compromised and threatened. 
So secondly, we do need to ask why the violation of freedom of, of religion or belief is so widespread and affecting Christians on pretty much every continent. This, as I said before, is a global phenomenon with multiple drivers, even though, as I said, there are some people who think quite wrongly that this is just about Islam. It really isn't. If you lift the stone of global persecution and look underneath, what is it you find? In contexts like in Central America where governments are weak, you find gang warfare on an industrial scale driven by drug crime. The most dangerous place in the world to be a priest or a pas pastor is Mexico. Drug gangs try to use communities for their own ends and often the only person literally in the firing line is the local priest or pastor. In many places in the world today, you find authoritarian, totalitarian regimes that are intolerant, both of dissent and of minorities. China is perhaps the most obvious example of that, but it's not the only one. In other places, you find aggressive, militant nationalism that insists on uniformity. So there are many politicians in India today who say that to be Indian is to be Hindu, and if you're Christian or Muslim, you're not properly Indian, so you don't deserve the same rights that proper Indians do. And in other places, again, you find religious fundamentalism in many different forms that often manifests itself in violence. Nigeria is a terrible example of that, but it is certainly not the only one. And you often find those phenomena combined as well. In other words, we find massive threats to human flourishing and harmonious communities today, and ultimately we find in those things significant threats to our own security in this country as well. So if we care about grave issues like drug crime, militant nationalism, religious fundamentalism, authoritarian regimes, we should certainly care about the persecution of Christians and about freedom of religion or belief uh, more generally. The Foreign Office says it's concerned with those big ticket items, so they really do need to be concerned about the denial of religion, uh, freedom of religion or belief that often underlines uh, and, and reveals uh, those things. You know, above all, I want to say we can no longer say that this issue of religious persecution is a, is a sidebar, marginal issue, just of interest to people of faith. Not at all. They, these are huge issues in the world today that we as Christians need to address and that we need to continue to push our government to address as well. And sadly, the COVID-19 situation has only made the situation worse. Weak governments have had to give all their attention to managing the pandemic. Authoritarian regimes use the situation to accrue more power to themselves. Militant nationalists tend to blame minorities for the ills that are visited upon them. And religious fundamentalism uses the current crisis as a cloak for increased persecution. There are sinister forces at work in the world today with many people suffering as a consequence. So the time for inaction and indifference is over. And therefore, as the report argues, if the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office took this issue with the seriousness it undoubtedly deserves, then it would simply enable them to do their job better by helping them to better address these very serious issues at work in our world today. So how is the UK Foreign Office doing? Well, I ought to say that before I go any further, uh, before I go any further, I can only say how we found things a couple of years ago. I can't speak for how things are now, but what we found then was, to be honest, all a bit of a mixed picture. Good in parts, but really not very good in others. One problem we found is that many diplomats don't stay that long in post, so they don't really get to know the country in the way that they should. And much too depends upon how committed individual diplomats um, are to this issue. And it depends too much on individual preference rather than implementing government policy. The Foreign Office has something called the Freedom of Religion or Belief Toolkit, which embassies are supposed to use, but many don't, and we found that some didn't even know that it existed. It requires embassies to advocate on behalf of individuals and minority communities, and some do, but many don't. Many people said that the Foreign Office used to be better at this than it was uh, in the past, than it, than it is now. 
Some diplomats, we found, weren't really bothered by it at all and were blind or dismissive of issues of, of faith and simply didn't understand it. To take an example, we were taken to task by some Foreign Office regional experts because we said in our interim report that sub-Saharan Africa, Africa below the Sahara Desert, was a, was a majority Christian region. It seemed such a blindingly obvious thing to say that we didn't really feel it needed justifying. But they disputed it. They said, no, it's about 50% Muslims, sub-Saharan Africa. Well, that is, that is simply not true. So in the final report, we justified what we said with a simple reference to some readily, readily available, reliable international research figures. But to my mind, that whole little episode displayed a very worrying level of what I can only call ignorance, or even worse, perhaps a tendency to see the rest of the world very much through, through Western glasses, through Western uh, lenses. A further example of this has been the approach that's been taken to the conflict in the middle belt of Nigeria. Now, if you don't know about this, there's basically been an ongoing conflict between Christian fathers, farmers who grow crops and the Muslim Fulani herdsmen who are nomads and cattle drivers and drive their cattle here and there in, in, in search of, uh, of, of water. And you know, often those, those communities come into conflict because you've got settled farmers growing their crops and the cows come along and eat the crops. Clearly, you've got a problem. Now, actually, these communities have lived side by side for generations with uh, occasional pressures and occasional tensions between them. But more recently, there has been a lot of really bloody violence. And most of the deaths have been amongst the Christian community. Now, if you talked to people as we did during the review at the Foreign Office about why this was such a problem, they would say, well, this is an old conflict between contrasting lifestyles, which has been exacerbated by climate change, because there just aren't the crops that there once were for the cows to, to gra graze on. In other words, in their analysis, the religious dimension was very significantly underplayed. Now, I wouldn't want to say that this is only about religion. That would be naive. But I think it's just as naive to ignore the religious dimension of the, of the conflict. And indeed, if you do that, you're ignoring some very significant evidence which we found. It is a complex situation, but it has a very clear religious component. And you cannot and you must not put your head in the sand and pretend that it hasn't. That point about it being not just about religion, but religion playing an important part, leads me on to something else that's really important. We argued that you can't look at religious faith in a vacuum. Persecution on the basis of religious faith intersects with other key issues which the Foreign Office takes seriously. So there are security issues that you have to take really seriously. Islamist terrorism hasn't just been confined to Nigeria. We've seen it on the streets here. But there are other key issues in play as well. Issues like gender inequality, modern slavery, forced marriage, people trafficking, poverty reduction, forced conversion. All those intersect with religious persecution and certainly with the persecution of Christians. So if, for example, you are a Christian woman in poverty in the global south, you're much more likely to be a victim of those things, much more vulnerable to modern slavery, much more vulnerable to forced marriage, much more vulnerable to people trafficking and forced conversion too. So if the Foreign Office cares about these issues, as it says it does, then it should certainly be concerned about Christian persecution. And if it takes Christian persecution seriously and the abuse of freedom of religion or belief more generally, it will also be much more effective at addressing those other, other really serious issues. So the overall verdict that we found was could do better. But as I say, things may have changed in, in the meantime, and there will be a follow-up to my review three years on from uh, the initial publication. So the clock is ticking, and we'll see what changes there have been. And I hope and I pray that they, there will be many. So what did we recommend? I just want to give you a little overview of the recommendations uh, that we made as we kind of begin to come into land at the end of this talk. As I said earlier on, if you lift the stone of persecution and you look underneath, you find some really unpleasant things. You find 
gang warfare on an industrial scale driven by drug crime. You find authoritarian, totalitarian regimes that are intolerant of dis dissent and minorities. You find aggressive, militant nationalism that insists on uniformity and brooks no opposition. You find religious zealotry and fundamentalism in many different forms that often manifests itself in violence. So if you care about these issues, then, then you should certainly care about the persecution of Christians and about freedom of religion or belief more generally. And that's why the recommendations of the review are as bold and far-reaching as I believe them to be. So actually that the UK can make a real difference in addressing those kind of issues in the world that we live in today. And there are two main thrusts to those recommendations. First, I argued that the Foreign Office should promote freedom of religion or belief indiscriminately and for all, not just for Christians. Why did I argue that? Well, first, because if you single out any one community for special treatment or favoritism, that just makes it even more vulnerable, and we have to avoid that. That's why the recommendations warn against unintentional othering. Indeed, I'm convinced that the single best way to protect Christians from persecution is to guarantee freedom of religion or belief for absolutely everybody. But secondly, I really don't think it's at all Christian to seek special favours for ourselves. Jesus was very radical in his definition of who our neighbour is. And he told us to love our neighbours indiscriminately, without picking and choosing and exercising any favouritism or making a special case for ourselves. So the first main thrust is that the Foreign Office should promote freedom of religion or belief for absolutely everybody. And the second is that the Foreign Office must address this issue much more proactively and face it head on. And I say again, this is not a minor issue that can be relegated to the sidelines that's only of interest to a few wackos and, and weirdos. It touches on key and critical issues in the world today. Specifically, we made 22 recommendations. Now, to no doubt to your great relief, I'm not going to go through them each individually. They're all, many of them are really rather sort of technical and complex. But I want to highlight just the three headings that they sit under, because I think those headings themselves are quite important. The first heading was strategy and structures. So this says, let's look at the Foreign Office in the round at, at the centre, at its operations in London. And we argued that freedom of religion or belief should be central to the way that the Foreign Office goes about its business. Put it front and center, we said, in the way that you go about your business. Now, clearly that's a big change, but in the light of what I said, I think it's essential. It's essential for reasons of national self-interest and security, but essential too because I think it's just morally the right thing to do. Second heading was education and engagement. And in that, we encourage the Foreign Office both to up its game in terms of understanding faith better and to use that understanding to work out just how it can operate more effectively on the ground in the many places around the world where it operates, simply so it can do its job better. And the third heading was consistency and coordination. Well, here we tried to work out some ways in which we could... Ensure that our recommendations influence the UK government more widely. Although this was a piece of work just for the Foreign Office, we felt that this was such an important issue that it needed a cross-governmental approach that touched, for instance, on the work of other key departments like the, the, Foreign, the, the Home Office, rather, the Department of Trade and Industry, the Ministry of Defence, to name just, uh, just a couple. And I'm delighted to say that that is now just what is happening. As I said earlier, not just the Foreign Office, but Theresa May's government has as a whole accepted the recommendations of the report in full. As I said earlier too, after Boris Johnson became Prime Minister, a commitment to implement all the recommendations featured in the Tory manifesto in 2019, and that commitment was reiterated in the Global Britain paper which the government recently produced. That was certainly far more than I hoped for or expected. Again, praise God for that. 
I believe that now more than ever, we must defend democracy and the freedoms it guarantees us, including freedom of religion or belief. It is needed now more than ever. We must stand against all those who would betray and undermine it through violence, through crime, through militant nationalism, through authoritarianism, through religious fundamentalism and bigotry. It matters hugely, I believe, to the health and the happiness of our world today that we should do that and stand up for those who are persecuted for uh, their faith. We should, it matters hugely that we should defend those many people whose welfare, whose liberty, whose communities, whose families and whose very lives are put at risk by those dark forces. So I hope and pray that my recommendations will continue to make a very significant difference in the days to come. I was proud and honoured to present them to the Foreign Secretary and proud and honoured that he commissioned me to do so. In one of his first speeches to the House of Commons on the slave trade, William Wilberforce presented the House with Thomas Clarkson's monumental and harrowing report on the terrible evils of the slave trade. And as Wilberforce did that, he said this to them. He said this to the members of the House of Commons. You may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say that you did not know. Well, we now know that this phenomenon of persecution for faith is a huge problem in our world today. This terrible persecution that so many Christians and other people of faith face. May we too not look away, but may God give us grace to face up instead to this great challenge of our times, just as Wilberforce and others in his day did as well. May God give us the grace and the strength that we need for that. Amen.